Hello and welcome to the MIG Plus One podcast, where I sit down with industry leaders to discuss the project to product movement. I'm Mick Kirsten, founder and CEO of Tastop and best-selling author of Project to Product, how to survive and thrive in the age of digital disruption with the Flow Framework. I am thrilled to have Jean-Michel Lemieux join us on today's episode. Jean-Michel is an author, investor, and advisor, and former CTO and SVP of engineering at Shopify. He has been working in tech for 27 years, initially building software and then building teams and companies. He was a founding member on the Eclipse platform and open source team and led the engineering organizations at Atlassian and Shopify. I have found John Michel's wisdom to be second to none, and I have learned so much from him over the years. So I'm just thrilled that he could join us today to talk engineering, architecture, scale, organizational design, and flow. So with that, let's get started. Jean-Michel, welcome to the Project Product Podcast. It is so great to see you after all these years of us uh, having had a chance to, to work together, sometimes in parallel universes. How, how are you doing? Great to be here, Mick. Yeah, I think it's been 20 years that we've, uh, we've known each other and, and haven't hung out like this. So thanks for inviting me and great idea. Yeah, no, it's, I, was, I was reflecting on it and I think uh, I probably spent two years getting to know you entirely through your code before I, I ever saw your face, I ever saw you in person and it was uh, all of that code in, the, in Eclipse itself where uh, I think as, as you remember, I was trying to make your code do things as it wasn't exactly meant to do. While I, I already, you know, there was, there was so much beauty and elegance to what you created there, it was probably some of the most extensible and cleanest code I, I saw in all of Eclipse and across those 60 million lines or whatever it was at that point. And uh, as, as I was trying to implement, as you remember, Mile and the aspect of your programming stuff and, and everything else. So just tell us a bit about how your journey with, with software started. Yeah, well, that's a, a great story. I mean, I, I do remember probably through Bigzilla as much as in code, yeah. because I think, uh, you know, in the, in the early days of Eclipse, as we, as we scaled and opened up and, you know, open sourced, I remember one of the interesting things, you know, maybe a bit of a tangent to start our conversation, but, you know, as a software developer, you spend so much time trying to make things work. You know, you're like, man, like you're in school, you're like, oh man, I've got to make the search algorithm work. I've got to, like, you got to make things work. And then I think a really big lesson around Eclipse was interesting is when you build a, when you build software with others, a lot of time it's just figuring out, like, how, how do you communicate? So I think uh, we spent 60% of our time in Eclipse once we open sourced it in Bugzilla talking with people. You know, I remember, ta- and I remember your team were, and you were doing something really interesting where you're trying to use our APIs in ways we hadn't imagined. And I think that's why I was, so fascinating with what you're doing with with Mylan, and I think wasn't it called Mylar at some it, point? It was, Mylar it was. But then the Eclipse Foundation realized there was a trademark issue with uh, Dupont. Because <laughs> oh, yeah. I love Mylar was great, anyway, um, and I, I, I think the uh, my fascination with what you guys were doing back then was um, I always like people doing crazy things with their software, and, and you guys you're probably one of the craziest in terms of just trying to do things that were like we had actually didn't know how to do it, right? And I think that's why we ended up. Hanging out a lot back then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I think the it, it was it was amazing trying to you know, exactly change the interaction model to actually be more around the collaboration around those bugzilla bugs, right? Those those tasks, uh, and I, and connecting yeah, that well, up to code. I, so, and I think for those who don't know what what you were trying to do with Eclipse, so Eclipse, you know, IDE platform was you're like when you're working on code, you should have a lens onto your code that gives you context awareness into the tasks you're doing, not just into the global, right? Because I think people get overwhelmed when you're coding with just having too much cruft around you. And then, so basically, if you think about what you're, what, what Mick was doing with Mylan was, hey, can I apply a, a filter on every part of Eclipse that, that I can change on demand? And, and, and for that, I think it was a great idea. I think you, you're, you were probably onto something. I think we just don't know how to implement it yet. So, um, but anyway, that, that was a long time ago. We can, but it, it was fascinating. Anyway, that's where Mick and I met. In Bugzilla and in uh, in Java development uh, twenty yeah. years ago, yeah, and and all our collaboration was through those Bugzilla bugs, right? So what what today are are Jira issues and other other issue tracking issues for people? That's yeah. where uh, I think it was probably a couple of years of of collaborating through that before we actually met face to face at a conference. So, exactly. and it, it did definitely. I mean, for me, it was super interesting because I think at the same time, we were very focused on understanding software architecture. You and Jeff McCaffer, you know, I read your book at the time. I thought, it was, wow, like, this is how you build these extensible platforms, right? Some of the extensibility back then that the, the two of you created is, I think, a, a lot better than some of the frameworks we see today. And it really established some of those foundations on extensibility, on modularity, on components. So having to be reusable. 
the I think that you know, the really interesting thing to me at that time was just it was not just about the code, right? How much we were actually collaborating and how much the in what we now call value streams had to do with that that flow of work, that collaboration through the issues, through those back then Bugzilla bugs, how that was a sort of a first class structure. And, and I think we've seen a lot of that, right? Because because after Eclipse, your work took you actually, you know, I mean, it was rational in IBM, but but then to Atlassian, where where you were very much working on on defining how issue tracking and how that collaboration across teams works, not not, not just at the level of the code, which a lot of us grew up around, but actually at, at that level of collaboration. So, tell us tell us a bit about that. Uh, what you learned through your days of Eclipse and IBM, but then actually what, what took you to Atlassian to becoming the VP of engineering at Atlassian? Yeah, um, so I think what, maybe just back up a bit. So, you know, I had a pretty, I guess, boring, you know, kind of entry into software development, you know, like, you know, went to university, told my parents I'm going to, going to computer science because my guidance counselor told me to, and I didn't have any better ideas at the time. And, um, you know, back then, like, my parents knew no one who had a, like was a software developer, like they didn't exist, right? So they're like, okay, I guess, uh, you know, wrote software for a while, and I think in the in the early, I could say early days, but I mean, it's not like we're that old. We're like we're fifty now. It was actually really interesting software we're building, you know, and maybe there was a bit of a luck, but you know, graduated university, and then in like ninety three to ninety six was both the invention of the internet, but also more importantly was the invention of telephony as we know it, right? The digitization of the telephone networks it was pre- probably like the first place that I guess modern software was being deployed and, mm-hmm. and people were paying for it. There was a bit of a, an arms race to digitizing the phone networks. And if you think about the kinds of software you need to run in phone networks, it's actually pretty complex, you know, real-time systems, distributed, like I'd say, I'm going to use the word cloud now, but yeah. you know, there's computers, every, like, you know, so you know, like right out of school, I was using you know everything I learned, right? Like distributed system, TCP/IP, non-blocking sockets, moving, like doing fraud detection on phone networks. Where because as soon as they were they were rolling out new you know new technology, it reminds me a bit of crypto today. Like first thing that really? happens is people pe- you were doing people fraud. I didn't realize we were doing fraud detection too. Wow, we're doing fraud detection. We're basically doing yeah, like because people were doing like like reverse call collect, like fraud, and right. like, so because it was it was just you know everyone was imagining software like just enabling all these new use cases the problem is you you enable them and you just don't know all the back doors you left open right so there was a bit of a it was just a fascinating time and and also like the phone networks were busy you know so the software you're deploying right away you're getting millions of phone calls like it's anyway for, for me it was like just you know the, the net it was like really really interesting software to write i found it like intimidating like it was like you know i was in bell canada's like central office at you know i had between 12 and 4 a.m. to upgrade our software like uh-huh. it was that was what it was like and it was like fascinating um i maybe i got lucky people people don't talk about people talk about netscape and and web browsers and microsoft but a lot of us who were building out i guess more of the telephony space it was um just really, really fun software. I'll get to why that helps Shopify because it does. There's a connection to Shopify later. But so, I, so I, I guess a bit boring writing software, doing that, and then, you know, I think because of the t- ki- kinds of software we're running in the telephony space, it was complex. You know, and I think we, you know, at the time, uh, you know, in Ottawa, like Nortel and BNR, we're like, we're always searching for different. Like, th- there must be a better way to write software because it was hard. Like, it's talk, it took a lot of time, a lot of money, and. I mean, we weren't that good at it, so it was pretty buggy. And 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 this was mission critical software. You know, this was not a social network where, you know, if you have too many likes, you just stop accepting likes. Like these were phone calls. So, so I think there was a bunch of really interesting spinoffs that came out of of the telephone um, industry around how to b- write better software. And and one of those was in Ottawa called um, Object Time. Yeah. And I don't I don't know. If, Anyone remembers Object Time? We were a small startup of 100 people, and and Rational Software ended up buying us. So that's kind of how I got into like the, I'd say almost the software methodology space of Rational buying this startup in Ottawa because we came up with a kind of a it was like kind of real time. It was called real time object oriented modeling, which is a way of of defining real time systems and modularity encapsulation and just making it easier for you to build distributed systems, which was again the hard part in in, in telecom. Uh, we got bought by Rational, and then you get sucked into just thinking about how to build software a lot, you know. So I think it was a really, in some ways, boring, but also interesting of just writing software and then being bought by a company, Rational Software, who was supposed to be a bit, um, a bit of the teacher of how to write good software, and then you know ran a bit of time in there, and then um, Eclipse kind of was a really natural evolution to 
okay, we've been doing this for a while. Let's help developers write software. So that was that's kind of how I got into into Eclipse, having I guess written a lot of software, knowing how hard it is, and I think trying to make it, yeah, you know, trying try to maybe advance, you know, the 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 space of just making it easy to write software. That's so that's the, that's up to Eclipse, and then you know you're with me with Eclipse, which was both humbling because I think I guess for the first time we wrote a platform that was open. You know, and we we built a community around, and I think that was you know really good. But it was really good software. You know, we had really good principles, and I think that was that was fun. And uh, I think you participated in that. And I think after that, at some point, I was like, I always found with Eclipse that we could have created our own company. Like we could have yeah. spun out, had a amazing like built a billion dollar business out of this because I think we it was probably one of the funnest teams I've been a part. And I think me going to Atlassian was I was like I'd love to build great software and be in a business. Like, yeah. how do I do both together? So I think going from a bit academia of software and open source, I was like, how do I build a business? And then for me, that was my next chapter of like, it looks like it's really hard. And all the telecom companies that I grew up with, you know, BlackBerry, Nortel, they'd all died yeah. because of other things. And for me, it was a, 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 there's a curiosity of going, man, it feels really hard to build companies. Yeah. And, it's, and so it, it, you know, from software to building companies is kind of that transition of why I, I ended up in a, a, at Atlassian. Well, I actually think we would have been better off if you had spun out a company like that. And, and it was back then, OTI, Object Technology International, was doing this for a while around Smalltalk as well, right? But if we'd had that for the Java ecosystem, I think you know fundamentally we would have we have better tooling today. But I, I guess notably, what what you started seeing, actually, what Rasslin even was seeing, is that the way that we manage work, the way that we track work, all this issue tracking was becoming a really important business. Model and then system of record in its own right. So, spent all this time coding and learning about these issues of scale. I'm sure we'll get back to when uh, when you talk more about Shopify. Then helping others code and building this extensible platform. And then yeah, yeah. Tell us tell us more about how then that shifted into uh, into moving to Atlassian. I think I was just. It's not that I knew how to write code, but I think one of the interesting things around Eclipse is you know um, I became a manager. We built you know um, we built some other you know technologies. And having seen businesses die around me, I was like, the combination of of building great software and building great teams together, I think is like the hardest thing to do, right? And and how I think the best companies end up flourishing and the best communities end up flourishing is those who can do both. So Atlassian was a company that I think we're kind of competing against a bit, you know, like they were basically our competitors to, you know, Rational, who had been the big developer tool company out there, right, with bug tracking and version control and all that. And, and I saw these two... Um, Two young dynamic, you know, guys in Australia doing it. So I, I, uh, it was November twelfth. I, I still remember it. I was having dinner with my wife, and I said, "I'm going to send an email tonight that could change our lives. I'm going to send an email to Mike and Scott, who are the CEOs of Atlassian, and say that um, I think I can help them out. And you know, it might turn out. Do you want to move to Australia? And she's like, "Yeah, whatever. Just anyway." I th- she thought I was joking. I sent the email out, and you know, before you know it, we were in us. You know, moved the kids to Australia and was was leading the engineering team at Atlassian. And way over my head. I, I remember those days. So so uh, yeah, tell us. It just just it'd be great to hear more about that. Is uh, how did it start? What were sort of the, the the main things that you were trying to achieve at the start? And uh, yeah, how did you get it over your head? One of the things that I would not appreciated as much about the Eclipse team was that we kind of grew up together. You know, we we went from a small team to a bigger team, and I think when that happens, you end up having these super high bandwidth conversations with your peers. Because you have this shared context of so of just so many learned experiences that, like, you don't write them down. You don't, but you just you build this shared context that's like so valuable. I land in a new continent, a new company. You know, like the tech stack. I kind of like it was OSGI and Java, but right. but it's more around the people, the culture, the history. And next thing you know, I'm like, why can't people read my mind? <laughs> like my old team, you know, like, and I say that in a, in a good way. Like we'd read each other's minds. Like we'd yeah. we'd fully, you know, finish each other's phrases. And I think I think landing in a new company where I don't have that context and they don't have the context on me was re- like honestly it, it might sound really simple, but it was like it, it threw me for a, a loop for like the first year of going holy shit I've got to build all this up again right build trust build context on technology build context on culture before I can get back to having these high bandwidth conversations that I just left because I'd worked with the same team for ten plus years. Right, so that, that that's so interesting, right? Because you knew the tech stack. I'm sure you got your head around the architecture really quickly. So it really was the the team structure and dynamics and leadership. That, Absolutely, that and, and the, I'd say that the 
culture around the company, you know, like just like what have, what have they been talking about that I wasn't privy to? What decisions have they made that I haven't been privy to? And, and um, how do they work? And when I showed up at, La- at Atlassian, I think, you know, one of the biggest projects that was ongoing that had just started was moving to the cloud. Yeah. So this is 2010, moving to the cloud. How do we, you know, how do we do that, right? And that was that was just obviously fascinating back then. I think was a, a really good decision, which is you can either change your entire tech stack, or you can put VMs in the cloud in a very efficient way. And I think at that time we decided to put VMs in the cloud. Very yeah. What was it? Racks just VMs running on the rack space, single tenant back then. When you started, yeah, it was single tenant. Uh, I forget what was. Um, there was kind of like these micro VMs. It wasn't VMware, and it was like our own kind of managed VMs that we could run and spin up. And actually, it was a small uh, colo provider that we were partners with. It wasn't okay. in Rackspace. And yeah, we'd spin up single tenant instances for probably we, we did that for like five, six years. Wow, I know some companies still doing that today. <laughs> but well, you saw it's hard you, to. Yeah. I mean, it's fascinating because I think the um, you know let's, let's go to cloud software because at last thing was probably my. It's always a bit of an introduction to me, you know, because yeah. we've been writing software, but you know, not, I guess, not in the cloud shape as much. But um, you have to write software very differently, right? To be multi tenanted and all, all that fun stuff. And I think the entire planet now has, you know, we, we wrote software in a, in a way that wasn't, you know, it wasn't cloud native. And I think AWS has been really good, and, and they realized really early that people moving into the cloud. Aren't just moving like it, it's not moving. It's basically rebuilding their platform. Yeah, right. And and helping people do that is is um, extremely valuable. I think at the last thing, I think a mistake I probably made was delaying that architectural change. You know, I think we were in scrappy. You know, this is pre IP, like way pre IPO of it last yeah. thing. We're like, let's get this thing running. Hard to say if it was a good call or not, but I think, you know, if I had to go back in time, you know, with a time machine, I probably. I think we should have taken one or two pieces and split them out, like like cloud native built them. You know, like not the whole stack, but say, hey, yeah. let's why don't we make search? Okay, like like take a yeah. feature and go, hey, we could build search in a cloud native way, right? Cross platform, multi tenanted search really is usually is has a good API towards it, right? It's like you take you know you can yeah. suck the data into it, index it, multi tenant it, and then bring it out, and you know even we can even still using Elasticsearch and Lucene, but we could. I think I would have taken a couple of those components. And made them multi-tenanted, made them cloud native, have them plug into the, you know, the single tenant version of Jira or Confluence, whatever yeah. we're running. And then I think have bring that culture into the team earlier versus I think we it took a bit longer to do that. So Yeah, and I think when we get back to what you did at differently at Shopify, I think let's 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 get back to this topic because I think that, that is some of the you know key learnings. It's it's great getting these these out right now for others to hear. And of course we'll we'll send resources to I know you've been documenting some of this through Twitter, through this this book that you're writing. We'll get back to that, but I'd love to just dig in some more into that because I think we so many people out there are now faced with similar decisions that, that you were making back then, right? Which is how quickly to move their application portfolios, their workloads to cloud and I'll just never forget. I remember actually where we were standing when you when you told me, "Oh, I'm going to actually fork the code base of Jira and and beyond." And I thought this was such a crazy thing for me to hear you say because all our and this is many many years ago now, but every all the kind of mutual work we'd done we were really around extensibility and modularity. And I thought, wow, like that just seems so wasteful for for Jean Michel to be to be splitting the the code base into the cloud code base and the multi tenant code base. And I feel like. For the following years, I actually learned why that was such an important move. And of course, now you've got more approaches where you've done that in a pocket and split out some services like Search and and gotten that DNA, into, the operational DNA into the teams and so and on. And that's but, what the fork actually ended up being being right is 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 building some cloud native native services and this, and saying we don't have to make them on prem, right? Just like a, a lack of a baggage. And I think there's a really good saying which is. You know, duplication is better than neuronic abstraction. Right. And I think that's probably at the core of why the fork was at that time was the right step to take, I think, to to for the long term architecture of, of the Atlassian platform. Yeah, and I think I still see this as being very counterintuitive to so many of the enterprise architects out there, right? Is that duplication is, is better than neuronic abstraction. Because again, it's based on a lot of what we learned through computer science, through our, through our training or our coding. Is it, it just seems wasteful. So, so take us through that, through how you did that, through what you learned, and and maybe you know what you would do differently. 
Well, I wasn't there when it ended. Like I think Atlassian just <laughs> end of life. I think their uh, server platform, which was the you know single tenanted version of. But, but, but um, that, by the way, just blows it. me away that the decisions you were making ten years ago actually had impact on news I saw yesterday related to Atlassian stock price and how they're handling the the, the fork of server. Right, so these the impact of these architecture decisions and how they're executed has have these massive consequences in terms of actually the value they build, the growth of, and the way that companies can can fundamentally support their customers. I, mean, I don't know why it's that surprising. I mean, if you think about it, like as an engineer, you really don't know if you've done a good job until five years into the future. Right. <laughs> Which is like if you're writing the code, is like did it did it age well or not? <laughs> right. Like basically a lot of like did it get us closer to where we're trying to go. Like you don't know those right away, right? Like yeah. we're, we're building things that are into the future a lot more. So I, I think that's, that's what's hard being an engineering leader is you're basically making a bunch of bets, you know, into the future and you won't know until, you know, for a while. But I think, I think the bet that, that at Atlassian um, we were making at the time was, was a lot of things you're trying to do technically is about improving your velocity of, of uh, evolution, right? Like software yeah. is like, it's almost like a biological system. Like it's not fixed; it, it evolves. So, we're like, what's the quickest way we can evolve this thing? And we'd realize that, you know, as, as I said, we we did VMs, we did single tenant, we tried to evolve it, kind of all co mixed together, and it was too slow. We had yeah. to go build some cloud native things, and without the handcuffs of saying we're going to have to build two versions of it right away or figure out how to make it work. Like, just there was a cultural burden that was away, and and it sped, sped up velocity, right? And then, yeah, you know. So I think it's. So I think that. I mean, that that was the the crux of it, right? Which, I, th I think. And, and if you think about it, every time you evolve your software, you end up forking something, right? Like yeah. at Shopify, like we're going to add a new tax system into it. Well, we keep the existing one. We create the other one in parallel. We route traffic to it for a while. We make it do twenty percent of the use cases. We you know test it out, and at some point we we merge it back, right? Forking and merging is how we develop software forever. Yeah. And I think the last one was just a bigger one that we we had to talk about publicly because just managing expectations and there are customers who are like, why am I not getting features? So I think, you know, as part of building a company, I think selling the vision of where you're going ended up being important. Yeah. And I think that that's why I think there's a lot of emphasis on it of just letting people know a last thing we're building for the future. And do you want to, you know, it might be bumpy, but come on the ride with us. Yeah. Well, and that's I think that's what's so fascinating about the, about the Atlassian one was it was it, it was visible. It was so significant, and the decisions that you made resulted in billions of dollars worth of value being created. And if they'd been made differently, or you'd wait another three years or some, something of that sort, it could be in a very different spot. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of people uh, like this is this was not my decision really. I mean, it was it was all of us together, and I, the founders were like Mike and Scott, you know, really pushing us. Like Mike and Scott, if I learned anything from them, was you know they're their incentive questioning of like, could we be better? And what, what, you know, how do we get better all the time? And I think like they're, uh, um, they made this, like made the environment so this, this could be possible, like make these big bets possible. So awesome. And they kept at it, right? My, uh, my, my replacement at, at last, and you actually just left Shree. We didn't overlap. I think he started a year after, but I know we, we talked a lot when he joined about keeping that going and, and, you know the the insets of kind of investment we have to make, and maybe th there's a lot of people who aren't in the situation. You have a lot of paying customers. You know, there's a lot of pressure internally to just keep going <laughs> the yeah. way you're going. You know, I think Microsoft's probably a really good example of a platform level change that they waited 20 years too long to make. Right? Which is think about how does every Microsoft product store files on the file system? Cool. Okay, the cloud doesn't work like that. So yeah, you know, or or so I, I think like Microsoft have been rewriting their. I mean, their, their client server architecture for a while. And I think one of the things that their, their current CTO told me was, again, their biggest mistake was delaying that a bit too much, right? They had to fork, they had to go, okay, we have to build cloud native again. Mm -hmm. and, and cloud native is storage, UI, like how do we do UI and where do we put the business logic? Like those are the three things you always have to think about. And, yeah. and in, in a, a, a very fat client server app, a lot of that was on the client. And we're like, we have to rewrite that. So I actually... The conversation I had with the the CTO of, of Microsoft at the time was just very impactful in that, you know, as engineering leaders, we're all in this spot where we're like, when do we, how do we evolve our software and how do we know when it's the right time to make a big fork versus a small fork? You know, and I think that's, there's just, I mean, there's no answer, but I think, you know, great engineering leaders at any point in time have a bit of a map of going, here's where I could be, you know, looking for a step change and, and how to invest in that, so... 
And I think that was a big, I guess that was a lesson from Atlassian that I took into Shopify. <laughs> and that was very, very high in my mind right now, which is what architectural changes do we have to make. And I think my, my brain now is very wired to doing them sooner than I would have in the past. Right. And so I think it's interesting that, interesting that when you put it where the CEOs of Atlassian create the environment to empower those changes. I love what you said, that is that it's the changes were about improving the velocity of, of your evolution, right? So to me, when I think one of the biggest learnings and it gets into the flow framework is we have to architect for that velocity for each value stream, right? We can't create these, this one single platform that just becomes a dependency on, on everybody is that duplication is okay as long as we're increasing velocity, right? It's, I think it's a lot of what we've seen on one of your colleagues, Jordi Henderson, he and I talked about this on, on, the, on the previous podcast, right? Is that it's just optimizing around that velocity and the velocity of the evolution, how much quickly you can get better. And of course, being, being able to measure that, are we getting better? So, and I think that, that, that fundamentally is what I've seen people helping people break through the, the sort of brick walls they have on, on never allowing duplication. They're always trying to centralize everything and again, trying to over-specify things rather than providing that, uh, that autonomy to each of the value streams to, to go faster and figuring, it, figuring out how to go faster. Yeah, so, I mean, to that point, there's a, a bit of a mental model that I forget who, I, uh, I probably influenced by a, b- a bunch of people on the internet around this, but to your point of like, when, do, like, when you're writing software, like, what kind of software do you write for what features? You know, like, is it, is it, you know, do I, do you, do you have to like sweat the details of every line of code do you write? Like, how do you decide? And I think the best bundle model I've come up with is um, you have to think about all the projects that you're doing around either it's a platform project, it's a feature project, or an experiment. There's three kinds of yeah. things that you're doing generally. And, and you know, I'm going to take out all the nuances, but just three buckets, right? So the platform work you're doing, I'd say, is 50% of what your roadmap is. And those are things that you've extracted from under from writing a lot of software, and you've found out you found some primitives, right? You found some shared primitives. You found some abstractions. You found, you know, some places to put it in your code where you're going to enable a lot of things into the future. And that's half of your roadmap. And those are things that, again, like platform work has to enable new things to happen in the future, right? They have to like I'm adding this concept into my our core thingamajiggy that's going to be able to be used in all these different ways, cool, that's a good investment, right? And that, that code there has to age really well. But then 40% are features where, you know what, like duplication is probably fine, mm-hmm. right? It's probably time to market that matters. It's probably, like, like the risk there is actually understanding the domain, actually building things that, mat- that, care, that matter, right? Like, uh, like in commerce, like actually building a checkout that's that's going to be really, you know, that's that's going to be useful or building whatever, like a a loan system, whatever. Like that's those features there, you 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 can't over engineer them because you don't know enough yet, right? And they're providing value. And then ten percent are experiments, which is you better be ready to throw it away. And so I think if you don't identify the kinds of work that you're doing, your every piece of software you're going to write is going to look the same, or you're going to put the same effort to, which is not what the value you're getting from the business, right? Like, and I say value from the business almost. I sound like a pointy-haired manager, but like every every code that you write has a purpose, and it's never the same. And you have to know what your purpose is. And then when you know what your purpose of that software is, then you can apply the right tools to writing it. And I think the the, the biggest mistake I've seen make, people make is they they think all software has the same purpose, so they apply the same tools to every piece of software, and then it creates slowness, frustration, and even the worst thing is you've got different, I'd say. Types of engineers who are good at different types of writing software, and they put the wrong people on the wrong software system. So, in a nutshell, I completely agree with what you're saying, and I think I think you have to recognize that you're writing different software, and then as as a team, as as a as a company, kind of give names to those things and have dialogue around what are we writing this for, and then that's going to help you decide how you write it. Yeah, I think John. So Michelle, what I love, and I think you have documented this on your on your notion of platform investments, right? In the in the book that you're writing, and that can be found on your on your Twitter feeds. I want to make sure people don't miss this. You, you, people would be shocked, I think, in terms of a lot of the the way that portfolios look today in larger enterprises. The fact that you're saying fifty percent of your 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 software portfolio, those teams' efforts should be going into this, 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 this platform, these platform parts, right? Where one of the main things that we see, by the way, when we measure companies' value streams, is that you know there's some notion of greenfields and experiments, and everyone's enough people read lean startup and they're doing bits and pieces of that, right? So I think that that, that that's yeah, yeah. Under, that's understood somewhat. The vast majority 
of where the where the development is focused, where you've got all the thousands of staffs at these larger companies actually have to do on 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 those feature parts of things, right? And the Correct. underinvestment that we see. The typical in- distribution is ten percent experiments, which I think is people do because they're afraid of. They've read all the books. They're afraid of failing if they don't find the next moonshot or. Yep. Other. And then it's eighty percent features. Yeah, exactly. Ten percent platform. That's and right. And then and then they complain. Developers leave. Yep. Because the platform work actually, a lot of it has to do with up to like making sure the developers can actually write code in your company, and, yeah. and you like probably fifteen percent of the platform work is understanding what kind of software you're writing, like build tooling, infrastructure, like all that stuff that that developers need to actually write code is completely underinvested in most companies, and so it's it's an attrition problem. And then the other thing is they don't get any long term velocity; they get short term yeah. velocity because they don't. Because you learn a lot by building those eighty percent of features, right? You learn about where you're duplicating code, where, and sometimes it makes sense, and sometimes it doesn't. And then you're learning about abstractions that can enable more things. And if you don't go and bring those learnings back, and I think I, I have a diagram in in um, in that chapter of the book around yeah. those three types of work, like platform features and experiments, have feedback loops between them that are fascinating, right? So the the feedback loop between platform features and experiments is platform enables more features, and features enables more more uh, experiments and then in the inverse experiments informs the features and the features inf- informs the platform yeah so the minute you have a, an imbalance there you're you're and I hate the word debt but you're just creating like a long-term non-efficient software process right because you're not using the feedback loops and you're not learning and you're not taking those learnings and doing something about it yeah exactly I think you, you, to your point the 80 percent being on features is w- what we're seeing and because we, of course we get to measure all these flows right so the the two biggest flow dysfunctions that we see across the enterprise customer base that we have is is first of all too much load on the teams doing the features because they're always behind and because they're always but the bottom line is if we, if we actually look at their flow efficiency where they're blocked it's from uh, they're waiting on platform components they're waiting on common views of customer data common pipelines and right. you think you know all the cloud services that they needed to layer over that aren't there the other issues with infrastructure so i think i think you, you kind of nailed it and i really i think you, you speak about it so clearly is shifting to that is actually going to make everything go faster and getting getting to that right kind of balance and it's a really big difference if you're talking about thousands or tens, tens of thousands of developers the difference between 50% and and 20% it's a big number, and I've I've had to. Um, I guess in the past I did not protect it enough, and now I mean you know Toby knows. I mean Toby's a who is the CEO who is still the CEO of Shopify. Um, you know he's a developer, he's an engineer, but he also runs a company, and you know he would often you know he'd go, hey, those people are working on platform. Can I move them to this? You know, and I was like, you know, I just wanted to make sure he understood all the things that were that, that this is enabling in the future, and so there was always a good like you have to kind of and show the value. Like I I think you know. You have to run the platform like it's a product, yeah. As well, like exactly. it is a product, and I think yeah. Um, one of the one of the things I learned as well, just in terms of lessons as as an engineering leader in a bigger organization, I always found myself as the head of product for the platform, mm-hmm. and that meant that I have a, a, a responsibility to manage it like a product, which is. I've learned from product managers that they're really really good at being organized, and I actually wasn't that organized, and I wasn't that well. I wasn't that good at measuring kind of outcomes, so. In the platform, I, I'd say our five five of the most important features of every product are owned by the by the, by the platform teams: uptime, scalability, performance, extensibility, and like maintainability. Almost right, like like those are the five features. So I would have I would make sure I had a product team, you know, within the platform that we're measuring those things at all time, and and showing those as value, and show and actually showing this to our marketing team. Going by the way, you're always, you're only looking at that forty percent. Bucket of work to, mm-hmm. to promote as features, but we've got these five other features here that are that that have to be inherently built into the platform to be successful, and we're, like and they're useful. And it's it's funny because once once I, I I actually have to rebring this mindset into Shopify because I think I I was I ended up on the back seat of just doing what product said of just actually no like I personally own these features now, and it'd be funny you know we you know and you, you do interviews like. What do customers care about? They care about uptime. They care about performance. They care about extensibility. About especially in the enterprise, they care that your software can be can be malleable and molded. And I was like, you have to invest in a bit like Eclipse. This all came from Eclipse. You have to invest in primitives to make your software extensible. And and a lot of teams, I find, as you said, like in in if you measure their velocity, you'll see that they're all blocked on learnings of like if I only had like a workflow engine. Yeah, man, like that, like whoa. 
then build one. Ah, but who builds one? And it's hard to like, it's hard to figure out who's going to do that. And like, yeah. and, and, and I guess as a CTO, what's great is you, as a product, as a product owner of the platform, it's a fascinating and fun job then to just to take it with that, that discipline, right. And take that and take it seriously is, is not just technical work to keep, you know, to, to keep things running, but it's actually ext- like, it's probably some of the most valuable features of your entire business are, are owned by, by careful investments in those areas. Yeah, so this is what I'm finding so fascinating right now. Is that some some leadership in these large organizations is recognizing that, that 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 the digital platforms they're creating are the most important assets. But but that's not common. I think you've had the the privilege of working for CEOs who were developers, right? Mike and Scott were were sick of Bugzilla, <laughs> and so they they, they re-implemented yeah, some exactly. of that working style. The you know Toby, as you mentioned, it'd be great if you could just dig in a little bit. And I do want to get back to this point of the of the of the the platform as product and and ownership of that. But how you've effectively made the economic case for how leadership, the most the executive team, needs to think about these platform investments. You've actually come up with a very prescriptive number, which I agree with. It's, I think it's the same number that Jeff Lawson put in Ask Your Developer in, in, in that book, right? He actually said 50% around 50%. So, and, and you've successfully made the economic case to the companies that you've worked with to, to, to create that kind of investment. So, uh, how did you do that? Is it is it mostly through the outcomes? Is it mostly through accelerating velocity, accelerating learning, closing the feedback loop? Is there anything more? And for all those people who are you know now at 10, 15, 20 percent of platform investment, who are going to listen to this podcast and are going to go talk to their CEOs, any 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 more tips you have for them? So it's a it's a three step process. Well, not a three step process, but I think there's three themes to that are going to help you. I don't. I, I hate the word make the argument, but just promote that this is a worthy investment. Like this is like investment like any anything else, right? And and the first is a mindset of you're doing this work, like the platform work is because the business needs it. Not because you're you're an engineer and you like doing this work, right? Like it this is work the business needs, right? So everything you do has to be in the context. So step one was always I have to make the best use of my engineers. Right. We're hiring these, there's not a lot on the planet and we're fighting for them. And I cannot have a leaky bucket. Like I have to make sure at any point in time that my developers can get their work done, right? Okay, step one. And no one's going to argue with that. They're like, yeah, okay, well, well, how do you know if (laughs) they're getting work? Well, you've got to put some things in place, right? They work waiting for code reviews is the, like the biggest thing I see is just development environment set up, right? Like how long does it take for a new developer to get their environment set up? And they're like, ah, yeah, but we have this doc and we, ah, like, no, like, like it has to be, like you have to have basically a drop dead number that you never change at your company. And if it does, it's just, it opens a can of worms. And I've seen hundreds of companies that are like, yeah, well, we never. And then now it's actually two days and they have to do this and they've got to plug into this other thing. And it's like, you mean for speed of, of environment? Uh, just can I get my dev setup? environment set yeah. up and can I get a code, like some change yeah. production? Like, like that, yeah, like exactly. I said, the inner and the editor, like that has to be like, pick, I, I think we pick 10 minutes, right? Pick it, it has to be 10 minutes. Okay, bam. And then, okay, maybe it's 28 or, but it, it has to be enough yeah. and you have to keep it there every year. Okay. So that's theme number one of like, of platform work. And it's really hard to argue against that, right? Given how much money we're all spending on engineers yeah. and how we know it's, it's uh, the hardest resource to get. The second point is, and, and this is where I think CTOs or VP of engineering have to put a bit of their product hat on, which is really understand where the product's going and promote you know, and, and again, look at all the features and go, man, we're seeing some patterns here. <laughs> you know, we're seeing some patterns and some of these patterns are more defined than others and let's explore them. And at, at a certain point in time, you're going to, you're going to figure out for us to implement these well, there's some common ex- abstractions, right? And, and I think that that second bucket of what abstractions do we need in our platform? Like what, like new technology evolutions or abstractions that we need that are going to be hard. And as a, as a CTO or VP of engineering, you have to you can understand why you're doing it. And the tool I, I love to use there is, is literally writing up a bit of a, a, like an RFC on, hey, we're going to be adding, you know, like let's say Shopify as an example, right? Like we're going to add subscriptions to the core data model of Shopify. And we don't, we don't have to put it there. And, and the, I remember I actually wrote the, a draft of the RFC just because it was, um, it was a, big of a, a big debate because it was a hard thing, but we're going to add it at this spot in the platform. And I had a team with me and we built out a time horizon of like, if we do it this way, what, like, what are the pros and cons and what are all the features in the next five years that will be able to build, be built off of this, right? And then so basically it was almost like a feature investment plan based on right. some of this platform work being yeah. done or not. 
And that took about six months of work of just like, I, I had one or two architects, you know, trying to really understand it. We looked at, you know, um, that was a really good dialogue because then I was like, hey, we're, this is what, this is value that we're going to get. Now it's going to be hard to put it in this spot, but it's, it's, it's the right spot. And then the third bucket is measuring those five feature, those five product features that your platform enables, you know, uptime, performance, scale, extensibility, and like maintainability. Maintainability is mostly just like looking at your support queue mm-hmm. and, you know, just like the inherent quality of your software. So I think that that last bucket is having metrics and treating your platform as a pro, as as the main accelerator of of doing a really good job around those five product features. So for me, that's my portfolio. Like that's that's literally like I like every year I'd go to you know to my teams and I'd obviously be working with you know the the senior developers in my company to put a plan together that had investments in those three buckets, and I, I treated it very seriously. Like I, again, you have to put yourself in a in a mindset where you're treating this work as as importantly as your CPO is treating his roadmap, yeah, right. Um, but I but what I found most engineering leaders are too blasé about this. They don't have a plan. They think the product plans and you just do, and then you end up in a spiral of making, I'd say, the wrong balance of investments. You're making good ones, but you're you're ro- making the wrong balance, and over time, it's going to slow you down. So anyway, in a nutshell, sorry, I'm 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 kind of pretty. Ver- no, this is awesome. around this because yeah. there there's been so much learned experience yeah. about like me screwing up in this area, but that's my instruction manual, I think, for for making that possible and making and then, those investments possible. And then in terms of the peep, because in the end you need to, you've had to put people in charge of it, right? And we've seen different models for that where these platform owners, uh, the people doing the and, and effectively at some point the, the product management for the platforms, right? There's more the single thread owner style of things. There's, I think, more of what you did in terms of putting two or three people in a box. Uh, where, h- how did you think about who, who's got the platform ownership? Who's driving to these three goals? Who's making sure that developers are happily and then effectively able to contribute and driving the retention from your first point and so on? That, yeah. That's another benefit, as you mentioned pr- previously, of this. What, it, it's hard how do you because, bring those people in and how do you structure the actual leadership of the teams? Yeah, my, my recommendation is take like 30% of your engineering team and put them in the platform bucket just explicitly. Like just go, hey, like, you know, and, and you give them some of these features, right? Like they're 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 obviously building all the dev tools, they're building, you know, pipelines, they're you know, doing a lot of the infrastructure work, like make, make it easy for people to spin up services, like all that fun stuff. But the the reality is a lot of the platform work you're doing um, are in code bases where the features are happening. <laughs> you know, like there, it, it's not necessarily like there's just one magic yeah. API that all the abstractions go to, right? So the the other work has to happen is where you know, as a technology leader, you're influencing the roadmaps of all the other teams around the org, right? By doing by doing that homework, and you know, having a, a really good guild of senior engineers in all these groups who. You know their job is to like you know come up with the the plans for their areas that fit into the three buckets I just talked about. Like they would, you know, we'd bubble up and we'd share that, and it, you know they would have those tools to work with their product teams on, you know, the things that they do. But I think having that thirty percent just, I mean, I almost call it like a, a platform slush fund where I didn't all the time have to, you know, maybe maybe you know debate the one or two engineers. Like I, I had a bit of a you know the JML slush fund of, of engineering stuff that I didn't have to go and necessarily convince everyone it was. And then there's another twenty percent where you know a bit more strategic, and you know we had work in different product areas of you know I guess deciding the order of what kind of work do we do. So I think that for me that's worked really well because it it one is it gives you a team that can be led by engineers that are most of their customers are engineers. You know you have a bit of a freedom to move around without maybe some organizational complexity. But then on the flip side. Keeping you know twenty twenty five percent of the platform roadmaps in the actual product teams forces you to be highly collaborative and explain value really well so that they yeah. buy into it and then they um, and they help contribute and make it better over time. I think you know I, I've had some exceptionally good PMs who once they get it like they get super jazzed up and I mean this is like platform work's not complicated right often it's just where do we put this and why and um, I've had some, like amazing PMs who've been you know who've really you know, matured their thinking about understanding how these investments pay off in the longer term and, and having those throughout the org is way more valuable than having them all in one org. Okay, yeah, I think that this makes so much sense, right? And so for that 30%, you actually, it was more engineering heavy leadership in terms of how that work was being done and then you had more PM exactly. in the 20%. Yep. And, okay, and then, but were you still using the, like the two or three in a box model for the 30%? For the JML slush? 
Thirty percent? Not as much. It was probably like we had some uh, like technical product managers in that group, like doing a lot of you know collaboration. Like we had like shared projects with Google Cloud doing you know container security models, and like so we'd have some technical product managers who'd um, like really help, I guess, roll out some of the platform changes across the company. Because I think a lot of the platform work success is actually adoption. Yeah, you know, so it can't be built um, in a in a silo. Like it has to be yeah. built and adopted. And success is when it's it's been used and um, we're seeing value from it. So I think having some some of the TPMs in those orgs have been great. And then we actually started hiring UX people in for just you know the UX of our of the tooling we're building, right? The user experience of development environments set up. Oh, you did! Um, wow, that's yeah, awesome. Yeah. So okay. we, had a, we had a small UX team, not 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 great, not not they were great, not not big, you know, just. <laughs> The user experience of of using the platform. So, and and one of the tools we built, yeah. which was, you know, you're like, what kind of platform investments make sense? Is, you know, I think the entire tech industry have spent billions of dollars on developers writing code, right? Like in IDEs yeah. and like quick, you know, quick fixes and and you know, running tests locally and all that stuff. But there's so little money that's gone towards what happens when you press deploy and your code's in production. Yeah. Like like what what happens right or, or so I think we we spend a lot of time at Shopify and this was because probably a lot of history of seeing how screwed up it was and how lack of investment was as an engineering team you're running a bunch of things in production right and as an engineering organization when I go to my GitHub repo I see code that's stale and static and isn't running but as an Android what matters more is what we're running so we built this tool that helps us basically show everything that's running at Shopify, right? Who owns it? What's we actually had, you know, quality metrics, we had uptime metrics, we had costs, right? Just really understanding um, the things that as engineers we think about it when our software is running, to put that into a tool so that as a you know, as your org scales, we're not just talking about the the code we're writing, but we're talking about the code we're writing. And I like I guess that that tool probably again like saved us you know, having to hire another 150 engineers, wow. and right, just because what and and it's it's fascinating. We added the, a bit like we did in Eclipse and VS Code, like quick fixes, right? So let's say I want to create a new like a new yeah. like a new app at Shopify to do advanced taxes for whatever, right? Some some country somewhere. You can go and you can create an app and you can go. Actually, I want a pager duty setup. I want this uh, set up in Splunk, and I want a Datadog dashboard created. So what we did is we automated the development setup of the things you need to run code. Oh no way! That's the same so cool. way that your IDE was doing that yeah. when you're they, they you know like IDE scaffold like stuff. Yeah. I was like, why don't we scaffold what it takes to actually run something? And then the yeah. other thing we scaffolded was a culture of whenever you're running something in a company, everything is a different value, right? Some sometimes it's an experiment, and sometimes it's a tier one service. So so putting into this tool, going what's what's our tier one services? And then what what culture do we have around how we run those? And that's very different than tier four. And again, that's not in GitHub. I can't see it. So we 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 again that those are that was a platform investment that I think you know paid off. You know, again, over to, like we built that maybe eight years ago, nine years ago, and I think kept our engineering team sane and fast over over the years. But at the time, you know, it was it looked like we were. Um, you know, had maybe have not in, not invented here syndrome or or, but that was one of the biggest pain points is who, who's running what, who owns it, how do I decide? You know, how do I decide what? You know, onboard people into to explaining how, how do we care about running things? So that was a platform investment that was like I'm extremely like proud of, and I think is like paid off in spades. That's amazing. Yeah, and I think just kind of the clarity with which you know you think and, and describe the the different types of work and teams between you know between the platforms, the features, the experiments, but then actually digging into the platform and how much of this. I guess publicly, I'd seen so much of what you were doing on the platforms uh, wasn't supposed to Shopify's own ecosystem, right? Who were who were building on your APIs and supporting developers, but but just how much of it is actually driven by the, the, the productivity and the, the happiness and the success of the, of the internal teams as well. And so. you, you do usually hit you know, two stones at the same time. You know? So it's yeah. like, you know, we built this tool to help us run pro- software. It was like, because we wanted uptime to increase for customers. Yeah. You know, we wanted performance to increase for customers. Like, uh, and you have to build a system to do that. The same thing at Shopify, one of the biggest projects we had going was we had an API for our partner developers and we had an API for Shopify. Right, so the, like the UI of Shopify, like the mobile app and the the web admin, was all based on an API that partners weren't using. They were using. We almost had like a partner API, and I think you know as we evolved the platform, we're like we need the, it has to be the same one. Right. 
because we have to increase the quality of it because yeah. we're going to have more and more developers building on Shopify. We can increase the quality of it if we don't use it. And we can't let our partners like find the bugs before we do. Right. And by the way, we're like, and we had ideas of making it better. We had, it has to be more performant, right? So again, we moved to GraphQL and then we're like, we're going to have one API for, for everyone. Yeah. So again, it's like, you, you, we, we got a lot done with that, I'd say almost infrastructure project yeah. for the long term, right? Now we end up having an API that, um, that was powering our UI, our mobile apps, you know, that was faster. And in the same one that the partners were using, we had better feedback loops, better monitoring. And that's, but that was a plot, like a multi-year platform project again, yeah. that, you know, had some product input, obviously it made things faster and made developers faster, but it created feedback loops for the future, which like, it's hard to explain that on, you know, on paper, you know, why, why it makes sense. But I think every CTO or BP engine out there is like, you need a list or two or three of these. And well, you probably have a list of 10 and then you should like strike seven out because they're probably going to be you know, like waste of time. So the timing's not right, but there's always a time for one or two of those things that are going to set you up for the future. And that I think your gut's going to say it's too early. And I'd say start because you know what? It's actually easier to stop at some point than it is to start three years too late. Yeah. And in the end, it is a roadmap of what you're going to productize on your platform next, right? And, yeah, exactly. and just how much internal and external benefit you, you can get from that. So, so Jean Michel, it was to, to me one of the Things that was so interesting about you you moving into the the CTO and SVP and role at, at Shopify was you came into an even bigger organization, an even bigger code base. So I can only assume that you know overnight you turned everything into microservices and, and this beautiful architecture. But but can you tell us you know how you really approached it? Because I think you know, again, so many people out there working with such massive existing portfolios and code bases and underinvestments in platform and too much tech debt and all, all those kinds of things and just you, you, I think the pragmatism of your approach, where you know what you've told me about thinking of, of how you can actually work with distributed monoliths and the like, and and but get to some of these platform goals, just take us through that at a high level. Shopify had a very decent architecture when I joined, and actually one of the things I was so excited about was um, it was actually pretty simple. And Toby and Cody and like the the team that was there, you know, before I jo- I joined had a a couple of good values of just you know using a few set of technologies but being experts at it. You know, um, and at that time, I, I, I described Shopify as at that phase was a product. You know, like a really good product, but um, they kept like the surface area pretty good, like you know, not overly complex. So I think what I brought to the table was really the transition from a product to a platform, and I think that's the biggest change. Going okay, so we've got you know we got a tax service, we have this, and like they're all kind of. Like we haven't really like how's this going to evolve over time? And I think the the first I think all hands I gave it at Shopify I was like and on, at that time all the developers were writing in the same repo right? It was on GitHub with Shopify slash Shopify was the thing we ran. And I was like you know over time there's a lot of things that Shopify is going to do that not all our merchants are going to need at the same time. We're gonna we're gonna need to build Shopify like an operating system where we've got the we've got the kernel and we've got a lot of applications that are built on that and that's going to give us. One is long-term velocity because not everything has to be in core, right? It's going to give us a great platform. I mean, it's going to help us focus on what actually is in the kernel, what's in the core, and what matters. What do we get the most leverage out? So I think that's that's where I spent most of my time was was turning Shopify into a platform uh, from a technology perspective, from a culture perspective, and um, making it more extensible, making it so that we can have a big community of developers both within Shopify and outside. That can contribute to Shopify without all the code going in the same space, right? But I think there was a great foundation because we were simple. Um, like Shopify's architecture was simpler, and and Toby and Cody made it very cloud native, which was great. And I think the speed of evolution of the architecture of Shopify was, I think we might have been one of the fastest teams on hmm. on the planet Earth, right? In terms of what we've been able to do, right? Like rewrote our mobile apps in React Native, introduced a new. GraphQL endpoint, you know, multi hyper multi tenanted, you know, back end distributed around the world. We we're able to get we we split out, you know, we ended up I'd say we had a friendly monolith where our philosophy for splitting out new services was if they if they scaled on a different axis, then we would split it out, right? So okay. so if you look at Shopify, like the back office where you log in as a merchant is very different than the online store. Right. The online store is going to have a hundred million visitors and then you're going to have 20 staff. Okay, that's they they scale differently, so we split out the online store into a rendering pipeline into different things, and so that that was kind of how we we ended up, I'd say, modularizing Shopify along scaling axes, and then making it so that we can have different UIs on the same back off. So we knew we we're going to have multiple mobile apps that we're going to build right for different functions. So that's where we ended up having a really good API and saying, you know what, there's going to be a bunch of UIs of commerce 
right? There's going to be a button on your website. There's going to be a, a mobile app. There's going to be a shop app. Like, let's make the UI of Shopify a lot more pluggable so that we can have different commerce experiences. So that's that's probably the crux of what I did over like the seven years there was just that transition from product to platform. And then like having a couple of clear goals of, of why they're valuable to the business and, and, and shipping them. Awesome. Wow. That's the that- that's amazing, Jean Michel. So, so tell us, we've got to start winding down here. It's so great to hear you and see you capturing these experiences in, in your book and your website, building from the right side. So, just tell us a bit about where that's headed. Please keep doing it. <laughs> and th- thank, you for, thank you for sharing some of that here. And yeah, just tell us some of the kind of key things that, that you're now getting across to others following in your footsteps. Well, I, I, um, I found that, like a lot of us, you know, again, like we're leading engineering orgs. Um, we never took a course on this. We went to school for something completely different. <laughs> Although it's related, it's actually pretty different. It is. Really. Um, so I think my the the next phase of my career is I'm helping as many, you know, aspiring CTO, VP, engineers as I can um, to share some, you know, some like not just tips and tricks, but just ways of seeing things differently. Because I think we're not trained to see kind of patterns or see and in, in how. I guess large software organizations come together. So I, I, I'm writing a book called the "Building from the Right Side," which is inspired by a book called "Drawing from the Right Side." Um, and I did a kind of a fine arts undergrad in high school, and I think drawing forces you to look at things and 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 look at patterns. So I'm, I'm really inspired by like having your eyes open and looking at things and putting pen to paper. So I'm writing a book that's completely free on the internet um, with things I've learned and hopefully going to help. Everyone um, who's d- trying to do this, uh, look at their teams, looking at tech stacks, um, and ask the right questions at the right time, and, and hopefully, uh, hopefully, make it enjoyable to lead software teams. Okay, amazing. And, and have as fun as I did, you know. Yeah, so we'll we'll link we'll link the book and the website, and uh, because I think it's such a key topic, and it's it's come up on the last few podcasts I've done. Just to, just give us a little bit bit of a teaser. I think you talked a lot about the platform investments, but the, the alignment and autonomy. Uh, one of the most recent things that you've written that I think had just you know a, a massive reception out there on Twitter. So it's a bit embarrassing because it took me forever to f- figure out figure out this. But humans are trained to be autonomous, right? So um, in school, our job is to go away and come back and get an A plus and not ask talk to people about how we got there, right? Our parents are like, I can't wait till you're autonomous and you're out of the house and you fly out of the nest, right? So entire our, our entire life is about autonomy, and then people have written bo- books to remind us. They go, hey, I talked to all these humans and they really value autonomy. And I'm like, no shit. We like that's what we grew up on. But then when you build a company and a team, you realize that alignment is way more important than autonomy is. And alignment is what gives you a shared language of where you're trying to go and why. And, and it's hard to build. It's hard to measure. Like if I ask you, Mick, are you, are we aligned on this? You're gonna go, yeah. I'm like, give me a number. Are you happy about alignment? Yeah, it's an eight out of, I'm like, that's all BS, right? Like, no, but if I tell you, are you autonomous? Like, yeah, because my boss isn't bugging me or like, so, so autonomy is this, this like sacred cow and every company that values autonomy over alignment is going to die because you're going to have a, 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 a company with a lack of clarity, a lack of culture of actually even discussing things at the right level. Um, and I think we're all allergic to talking about the things that you have to get aligned on are actually a lot more in depth than you think they are. And books are trying to, you know, again, like get out of people's way versus why don't you just, you should be brainstorming on things, right? And as a boss, as a leader, as a CEO, a CTO, it was really important that I get aligned with my team and that we share a set of values of how we're going to build things. And then, like every project, like I would ask a lot of questions and I want my team to be asking themselves. So for me, alignment has to come way before autonomy does. But it's hard, and it's hard for me. And I, I value my own contribution as being the most autonomous CTO ever versus be the mo- most aligned. And I got, you know, you know, I got told like time and time again by my bosses, and it took me way too long to realize this. And then I hired, you know, like so many people that I had to have that conversation with again. I'm going, hey, we're going to be talking a lot. And I know it's not normal because you read all the books that says we're not supposed to. I'm supposed to get out of your way, but we're going to talk because what we're doing is so hard and complicated and changing that we're going to build. A really close relationship of alignment, and so I think that topic is underdone. And uh, I think, uh, as you can tell, I'm a bit excited because it's it took me so long to kind of get that realization. There's so much going against us, you know, wanting to to, to value that. So that's that's the crux of my books. I'm trying to find these nuggets of things that are maybe counterintuitive, and once you see it, you can't unsee it, and it changes basically how you it changes how you live and how you work with people, and hopefully, you know how. Um, yeah, like how fulfilled you can kind of feel in what you're doing. 
That that's awesome. That, that'd be another title. That'd be a, an amazing book in itself. That Lyman greater than autonomy sign. That's a, I know it's a big a, topic, but yeah. that was a thirty second. Uh, <laughs> that, was, that was amazing, Jean Michel. Thank you so much. I, I mean, just just kind of the, the the wisdom that you've shared, and I think there's people will be listening to this over and over uh, because there, there's just so much depth behind what you've done, and and thank you so much for uh, for for sharing it so clearly with the audience. Well, so, it was my pleasure, and thanks for teasing it out. <laughs> awesome. Well, till till the next time. Thank you so so much. Thank you to Jean-Michel for taking the time to join us today. For more, follow me in my journey on LinkedIn, Twitter, or using the hashtags Mic Plus One or Project the Product. Jean-Michel's Twitter handle is at JMWIND, and he's got some great content that he continues posting. You can also reach out to him on LinkedIn. I have a new episode every few weeks, so hit subscribe to join us again. You can also search for Project the Product at the book, and remember that all other proceeds go to supporting women and minorities in technology. Thanks, stay safe, and until next time. <laughs>